Tonight, we're joined by Paul Mason to discuss his latest book, How to Stop Fascism. Paul is an award-winning journalist, broadcaster, and filmmaker, and previously the economics editor of BBC Newsnight and Channel 4 News. His books include Clear Bright Future, Post-Capitalism, Why It's Kicking Off Everywhere, and Live Working or Die Fighting. He's going to be in conversation with Dr. Eva Majewska, Majewska I'm so sorry. No <laughs> um, Eva is a feminist philosopher and activist based in Warsaw. She's currently, uh, she's published one book in English, which is Feminist Anti-Fascism, Counterpublics of the Common with Verso, and four books in Polish, as well as articles and essays in journals and magazines, including Eflux, Third Text, The Journal of Utopian Studies, and Jacobin. Her current work is on Hegel's philosophy, focusing on the dialectics of the weak, feminist critical theory, and anti-fascist cultures. So we're very, very grateful to her for joining us tonight to talk to Paul about this. There is a Q&A box to post your questions. Um, that should be down at the bottom of your screen. I would ask that you keep your questions to the Q&A and a general discussion to the chat section. It helps us keep an eye on things and lets things run a little bit more smoothly. And if you feel like tweeting about the event, uh, we're at Houseman's Books and we'd love to see that. With that, uh, I will disappear now and let the event begin. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much for, for the invitation and thank you, uh, Paul, for your book and for the opportunity to finally talk about how to stop fascism and not so much, although a little bit as well, about what fascism is and whether we should speak about uh, neo-fascism, post-fascism uh, and other new notions. So at first I need to give you uh, this compliment, uh, which is that the focus, the constant focus on fascist politics, on how we understand it today, on how you read the historical events and historical um, ideologies of fascism from the perspective of now, because it is always done in this Nietzschean way of critically addressing the history. It's not, you don't build monuments or anti-monuments uh, to Hitler or other, uh, you know, important persona in, in, in the fascist movements. You also don't merely archivize those movements, but what you do, I think, and this I feel is a compliment, is, is to take a critical stance towards Mussolini, Hitler, um, the, 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 the fascist uh, uh, politics in Spain and other places in the past, but you also, um, um, elaborate on today's versions of fascism, focusing on Trump's politics and, and the supporters of Trump, focusing on, on today's racism for, in India, in, 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 in the United States, focusing on Bolsonaro. Um, you discuss also the, the, the British um, uh, uh, fascism, uh, historically especially. So therefore, the, all those discussions, they have uh, this in common, that you address them from the standpoint of now and the standpoint also of how to contradict this, how to stop it. And you come with a solution, which I will not reveal now, uh, because it would be uh, a spoiler. <laughs> so therefore, I will slowly, you know, slowly approach to, 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 to that point. And my first question uh, would be whether I mean, you define, fasc you give your own definition of fascism also, a very short one, which is fascism is the fear of freedom triggered by a glimpse of freedom. So I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on that. What do you understand by this glimpse of freedom that we might yeah. witness today? And also, what are the main characteristics of this fear that, that we are witnessing? Well, thank you, Eva, for that introduction. And thank you for doing this. Um, the, in the, at the start of the book, I, I mean, I, the, I offer really an anti-definition because I, I want to place big health warnings on this obsession that both political science and the left have had with defining fascism. Um, the, the, the historian Robert O. Paxton, uh, you know, 20 years ago, warned us that w where this leads is to, is to create what he called bestiaries, kind of almost biology books that describe different species, right-wing populism, authoritarian conservatism, fascism, etc. And you never get to an explanation, nor indeed, and this is not the historian's job, but it is the activist's job, nor indeed do you ever get to a strategic understanding of how to defeat it. So when I said, look, if you want a statement, a kind of summary of the essence of fascism, it is 
the fear of free, it's the fear of freedom triggered by a glimpse of freedom. I was drawing on my own experience of being an anti-fascist when I didn't, that wasn't my definition. Okay, so in the late 70s, early 80s, through to the early 90s, I was an active anti-fascist. And I, I believed the classic Marxist theory of fascism, which is it's, it's, uh, they are the militarized plebeian wing of the bourgeoisie. They are mobilized when the state is not powerful enough to defeat a, 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 an organized labor movement. And you defeat them on the streets, force against force. Um, and the reason why they succeeded in the 20s and 30s in Italy and Spain and France is because the labor movement didn't unite. That was the kind of theory. And, and do you know what? It was enough because we did contain the National Front. We did contain the British National Party. We forced it to evolve into a, a something like a populist party uh, with less violence and certainly to abandon its Strasserite, um, you know, its third position Strasserite, ultra-violent, pro proletarian orientation. Okay, so now looking at the, the emergence of, we're not just talking about groups, we're talking about, yes, groups, massive networks, much bigger than groups, and more importantly than anything else, a kind of spontaneous ideology that clings together very coherently and draws people in, like the people who stormed the uh, Capitol um, in, in January. And so I, I just realized I need to rethink this. And the two sources of this, which converge for me, the obvious one, as, as a, and I lay great stress on this in the book, is the Freudian Marxists of the 1930s, who said, look, they said in real time, Wilhelm Reich said in real time to the German Communist Party, you don't understand the subconscious. He quoted speeches from Goebbels, where Goebbels is using sexual imagery, transgressive sexual imagery. And he says to them, unless you understand what this language is doing to the subconscious of, of tens of thousands of lost people, Reich called them people in trouble. You can't defeat it. You can't defeat it with unemployment statistics. Mm -hmm. Now, what was interesting to me, and, and that is Reich's understanding of fascism, it's can I, essence. Can I, can I, it's essence, you, it's, essence, it's mm -hmm. essence is the fear of freedom. And so that, yeah, go, go ahead, Eva. Because... Reich is also one of my favorite theorists of, of fascism because he introduces this concept that anti-Semitism or other derogatory um, theoretical and political standpoint um, um, racializing any, any group of people is almost co completely based on the hatred of women. So this is another part of Reich uh, arguments, which I find absolutely fantastic because yes. then we get to this point where um, the exclusion of women, all those bad things that, that fascism wants to do to women and against women um, are explained. This, yeah. this is the, the main fear, the femininity, the weakness, the yeah. um, uh, disorder as opposed to the supposedly very orderly yeah. uh, masculinity. All those contradictions, all those binary codes are explained by uh, Reich, and when he traces Goebbels' and other fascist um, expressions, let's say, uh, he goes point by point to show that anti-Semitism and misogyny are built in the same, are, are the same yeah. logic, basically, and that what Nazis hate perhaps most about the Jews is actually their supposed femininity. Right? Yeah. Then Klaus Tevelait, uh, whom I don't think you mentioned, but who explored the fantasia of uh, the, all those fa male fantasies of the fascists, yeah. dwells into that. And my question to you would be, do you, well, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say it. For me, feminism is the core of today's anti-fascism, the mm. core. I think the women's issues, women's mobilizations, the discovery that we suddenly made in the second part of the 20th century, that women actually are politically potent mm -hmm. and are agents of politics. It took a long time for humanity to discover it, but finally we got it. And now we see in the Black Lives Matter and other protests, the majority of protesters are actually women in very many of those demonstrations. And also the biggest, you speak of the Capitol riot uh, by Trump, orchestrated by Trump. I would like to mention the women's strike. 
mm. in America, so one million women going marching against Trump, mm. and also the massive international women's strike in 60, 70 countries, uh, as yeah. it was assumed. So do you think that women, uh, women's issues, feminism, and the, invo the political involvement of women has a place in how to stop fascism? Uh, absolutely. And what the book argues is not that, that anti-feminism is the key driver of fascism, but that it is a co-equal driver of fascism to racism. So if you look at political science and, and the classic post-structuralist political scientists, people like Roger Griffin, his attempt to define fascism was it's violent ultranationalism. Well, OK, what, on the racial side, it has become violent ethno-nationalism. Well, and that's important because it explains why. And, and I think racism and colonial racism, white supremacy, is still like the, the co-equal number one driver of people towards fascism. Um, the, however, the, the new thing, and I think this is new, of course, Hitler and Mussolini were, were misogynists. They, and not only that, they, they desired a, a, a reversal and they mobilized for a reversal for such women's advances that had been achieved, above all in, in Weimar Germany. You know, if you watch that uh, TV series, Babylon Berlin, you can see dramatized a, 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 a radicalized and, and, and um, liberated working class woman who's the star of that show. What Nazism did to her was, you know, if she was a communist, put her in jail and kill her. But if she was merely a, a liberated woman from the twenties, it would put her back into the family. It would forcibly sterilize her if she had disabilities. It would, um, it would give her a medal if she uh, bore five children for the Third Reich. But here's the thing, Nazism didn't have to face a, a substantially liberated, organized 50% uh, of, of, of the population. Uh, we have, you know, Janet Yellen, the chair of the Fed, when she was a you know, working economist, called what has happened a, a, a technological reproductive shock. Um, the economic effect of women's access to reproductive technologies, i.e. the pill primarily, um, massively, I mean, fundamentally changed Western society. And now, if you want to be a fascist, what I say in the book is many people hate, you know, many white supremacists hate black people, hate migrants, hate Muslims, but not many of them have hit a black person or a Muslim or a white or a, or a refugee. You know, not many of them have the courage to do that. Every violent misogynist has hit a woman. And every young man dislocated in the world worried about his future, is, pray, is, is really open to the idea that, that the world is out of joint, that you should have alpha males, beta males below them, and below them women, and below them blacks, ethnic minorities, and Muslims. And what's wrong with the world is that women are above the beta male. So what's happened, and I think you point to this in your work, is that, yes, absolutely, as Reich says, that... The Jew, the Jew with a capital T and a capital J, the Jew in the Third Reich was seen as like the, like the carrier, the disease carrier of Marxism, but as you say, weakness and femininity, and also of the rule of law, um, you know, the, the Jude Franco Judaic legalism. So you, you, today, what's interesting is that there's a very weird psychology in the minds of fascism around black people and migrants. They're seen as a sexual threat, that's number one. But feminists, and they're seen as the people who are gonna destroy the white race through genocide, through breeding with the white race. So there, and Renard Camus, who wrote The Great Replacement Theory in 2012, identifies feminism as the what he calls the collaborator with the occupation. And if you do that, that's where they are. That's why they are equally at war mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. with the ethnic minorities yes. and with feminism. And also, not only that, moreover, 
I would continue <laughs> you just on this line, on this unfortunate and, and terrible line. I think this is what allows them, the, 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 the today's fascists, to become so international. For me, yeah. it was a great paradox when I opened a website of one of the Polish uh, nationalist groups that they had a sub page, you know, one of the things you could click in the first place. It was the international. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. And when you look at the today's anti-gender movement that, that which you mentioned in, in your book also, they are international. They have congresses of anti-genderists, you know, from Italy, from Poland, Hungary, uh, Spain, all, all, all those places, France. There is anti-gender international mobilization where most people hate women, as you said, in this or that way. They also split women or femininity as uh, Tevelite explains, into this holy mother and the unholy yeah. sexualized woman who disposes of her body otherwise than for reproduction. So this is this terrible femininity which avoids, you know, uh, marital bonds and, and all those uh, sexist patriarchal responsibilities that, that they carry in the traditional model. So all this makes them international. And I believe yeah. If, if we want to try to answer how to stop fascism, because you say you, you give one, uh, you give several advices, but one of them, I think, for the left especially, is terrible one. But I like it. I, I find it courageous to say it. So, so I'll say it, regardless of what you know. Lots of people might think. You basically argue for an alliance, a strategic alliance, as far as I understand your project, between the socialists or the left and the liberals to stop fascism. So I would like you to, to give us some points of how you see it happen, because as we know, it is a very difficult alliance, especially for the left, but also for the liberals in all kinds of ways. So how would you explain this sudden need for, for, for such alliance? Well, well the, Hannah Arendt once called fascism the temporary alliance of the elite and the mob. And we, when I started this work, you know, I, I did know about the popular fronts in Spain and France and elsewhere, even in Britain, we can talk about the British attempt to, at a popular front, which got Nye Bevan expelled from the Labour Party just before the war. Um, but, but what I was also aware of is that the first thing you learn on the left, and you know, I've, I've been a customer at Houseman's Bookshop for, 20, for 40 years, and almost the first thing you learn in those meetings that we had in the basement of Houseman's was that the popular fronts were a disaster. Well, they were, they led to the betrayal of the Spanish Revolution, uh, the French popular front fell apart, yep. <laughs> However, without them, there would have been no left government in, in France in 1936 and no left government in Spain in 1936 to fight the civil war. It's just an arithmetical reality. Now, I, I think that where we face, so what do we face today? We're not facing a rising militarized fascist movement that's winning elections. For example, Hitler went from 2.5% to 17% in the 1930 general election. That's not happening. What is happening is there's a division of labor between right-wing populism, so Trump or Bolsonaro or Marine I mean, Le Pen. Poland. Yep. yep. So they, they are happy to, the fascists are happy for them to be in power. They then attack democracy. They, they hollow out democracy. And what they do is create a, an ideological and physical space for the fascists to organize in. And no better example. I mean, Bolsonaro, two days ago in Brazil, attempted this, attempted to mobilize his people, the fascists and the far right and the military coup mongers. Trump did it in, uh, in January. So, so now we're facing that. It's, we're not facing the same sequence as in the Weimar Republic. So in the Weimar Republic, you see the German bourgeoisie looking for every possible way to keep the left out of power, there was no liberalism, really, except in the, a few Catholic you know, heartlands of the Rhineland. But, but what you saw was the, the gradual hollowing out, physical hollowing out of right-wing populism in the form of the DNVP, Alfred Hugenberg's DNVP party. Hitler took all his voters. Today, it's different. The, the modern equivalents of Hitler want the modern Alfred Hugenberg to be prime minister so that they can operate their preparations because they don't intend to march on power. 
sort of, you know, Mussolini style, immediately, they are waiting for a global collapse, the global collapse into ethnic civil war that's triggered by climate change. And so our job as anti-fascists is to keep this alliance of elite and mob out of power. That's what I argue in the book. And it's a modern version of the Popular Front. Yes. Of course, it, the Popular Front wasn't just a, an electoral agreement, although we're going to need electoral agreements. If you look at Thuringia in Germany, there is an electoral agreement among, among liberals and the left to keep the Nazis out of office, which nearly broke last year. Which is, um, which yes, is but, but one, to just finish, we also need the, the actual French Popular Front was a mass movement, a mass movement independent of the communists and socialists and liberal parties who, who formed it, and it was a cultural movement, mm -hmm. out of which emerged an ethos and I mean, when I say an ethos, I don't mean this metaphorically. I mean a literal moral code of anti-fascism. People swore an oath to defeat fascism. Mm -hmm. Now, I, it's that that I think we need to go for. And, and of course, it depends on the specifics of which country you're in. Next year, it will mean that the French left mustn't sit on its hands grudgingly saying we may or may not vote for Macron once we're knocked out of the French election. You have to... On the contrary, mobilize a plebeian movement that says, yeah, Macron is an asshole, but we have to defeat Marine Le Pen. The okay. number one thing. Yeah, okay, go. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to interject every now and then, and it's not because I'm impolite, but it's because I would like it to, uh, because first of all, we got a first uh, question. So some uh, uh, a person called Lee asks, Paul, how can we... Uh, how can the left ally with the liberals when the liberals have demonstrated they would rather have a right-wing conservative party in power than allow a socialist party a chance? So I will ask this question, and then the next yeah. question is going to wait a little. Yeah, and the next question is also very interesting. Right, like, okay, we had a great lesson in... So I, there's nothing I can do about liberalism's paralysis. I'm not a liberal. Um, we had a great lesson in liberal paralysis from The Economist magazine last week. Those of you who saw it, it chose the day when Trump's supporters destroyed abortion rights in Texas and the Supreme Court ruled it uh, admissible. The Economist chose that day to, ha to, to run a front cover against what it calls the, the uh, illiberal left. And funnily enough, it wasn't me and Alexis Tsipras and Die Linke in Germany they were worried about, or, or Iglesias in Spain. It was woke. That's what they were worried about. That, that by insisting on certain forms of language, by insisting that white people participate in the oppression of black people and men oppression, in, the, in the oppression of women, the left is mounting a challenge to liberalism, and this was the economist's point, that is equally dangerous to fascism as the far right. So it's like these guys, you know, or women in the case of Zanny Minton Beddows, who runs The uh, Economist, have learned nothing from history. Exactly. But, and but I want to, so, so you are right, Lee. How can we do this? Right. What we need to do, the left, is to realise we're no longer, you know, Terrible people though they are, and terrible things that they did in austerity, and the things they did to Greece through the European Central Bank and the IMF, terrible though all that was, they are not the main enemy. Because they, what do they want? A liberal free market capitalism run by, with a democracy, in which they're prepared to tolerate workers' rights, women's rights, gay rights, etc. Fascism will tolerate no, none of that. It will, you know, you know, the fascists put 150,000 people in jail in the first year in, in, in Germany, the, commun the communist cadre. And that's what they want to do to us. Okay. If I can find a liberal who wants to stop that, I will form an alliance with them that, that, that breaks some of my principles about, about, you know, about allying with people beyond the labor movement, because I think that the danger is so great. Following on the line of alliances and strategy, I recently uh, discovered a fantastic statement from um, Tony Negri and Michael Hart, 
who actually somehow dwell on Rosa Luxemburg in that. By the way, yeah. I greatly missed Rosa Luxemburg in your book somehow. I felt like, oh, she's going to be there. She's going to be there. And then three pages later, no. And then again, so that was a kind of anxiety attack I had. Uh, but uh, that on the margin. So they speak of the debate, which is so lively in France, especially, but also in Britain, in Polish the radical left as well, which is the huge 19th century purely historical debate concerning revolution or reform, yeah. right? A huge discussion. And then Negri and Hart give a very beautiful and very Luxembourgian line to it, which is this debate is a historical one as we have not tried to redefine revolution and reform according to the historical process which has happened between the 19th and the 21st century. So if we want to engage in a discussion reform or revolution and I'm, you know, I'm backing you up. Mm. I'm backing up somehow, some part at least of your vision of strategic alliance because as much as I think the left can demand some changes from the liberals. So I, I wouldn't say, I accept you, Macron. Never in my life. This I wouldn't say. I might vote for him, but I would never say it. <laughs> That's the, and I think this difference matters because it produces a certain pushing and a certain uh, and a certain uh, and a certain influence that might prove to be effective, might not. But we have to repeat it over and over yep. again that this kind of neoliberal uh, austerity politics, this kind of uh, uh, corruption, this kind of all, all kinds of other things that liberal yeah. politics are guilty of will not be forgiven. So that's, that's, that's my addition to your alliance, but reform or revolution. So what do you think? How can we, and I think you give some, actually you give some inspiration for it in your book because you perceive fascism and anti-fascism as hybridic, as multi-layered. You, as far as I understand you, correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I understand you, you are ready to embrace the strategic sometimes and ontological some other times, ontology of the uh, of fascism and the need to address it in countercultural ways, in mainstream cultural ways, in parliamentary ways, in activism, so on the streets, in the university, in all kinds of places. And this is another point of, uh, of your book, which I greatly appreciate. So could you tell us a little bit more about this hybridity versus homogeneity of, anti -fasc of fascism and anti-fascism? Well, let's start with fascism. Okay, well, there are in the book I argue that what's happened, what's changed in my lifetime is this. When we were chasing the British National Party and the National Front around London or the East End or Bradford or Batley, where we, you know, they still are, um, we were dealing with... a. a a tribute band to Adolf Hitler. You know, in private, they had swastikas. In private, they read that the Holocaust didn't exist. They were, um, however, rational people. They, they had a rational fear and hatred of Indians and, and, and uh, Pakistanis and Jamaicans, that they were organic. I put this as well. Many of them, their grandfathers had been fascists. The pubs they drank in were fascist pubs. They, they, they lived in a world where they didn't have to believe that the elite of Britain is uh, our lizard people who have arrived from space, you know, or that uh, Hillary Clinton is part of a global paedophile um, conspiracy that drinks children's blood, okay? So they were a tribute band to fascism, and they operated on the plane of, of rationality. Modern fascism has been regrown from its philosophical roots. So if you think about a graph, there's Nietzsche, there's Bergson, there is uh, Houston Stuart, Stuart Chamberlain, the scientific racist, there's Spengler, you know, the decline of the West, there's Julius Evola as the, as the transmitter, but they, they almost miss out Hitler and Mussolini. So the modern fascists, what do they want? They want Carl Schmitt and the state of exception, as yeah, you yeah, point. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, they want more than that. They want a global ethnic civil war which produces massive ethno-states modelled on the work of Carl Schmitt. Carl Schmitt argues big spaces need single governments, and in those big spaces, in a stable society cannot have heterogeneity. It can't have... It can't have a communist party. It can't have an ethnic minority. It can't have fem. By by definition, it can't have a feminist movement. It's got to be. It's got to be a, a ethnically homogeneous uh, society. And what do we do about the people who don't fit into it? We kill them. 
That's their goal. And this is the other thing. The genesis of fascism, certainly in Mussolini's, in its Mussolini form, and early Nazism, genocide was implicit in Nazism, but it was rarely explicit. If you read modern fascism, for example, Alexander Dugin or Guillaume Fay, he's dead now, but you know, this kind of porn star turned philosopher, Guillaume Fay's work are work is, I think, the, 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 the epitome of what modern fascism is. He just says, we need to re revive the Nietzschean blonde beast, the, the man who will transgress, who will kill, rape, and murder, uh, and maim, run away laughing as if he just played a joke on someone, because that man has to transgress. And Faye is clear, the transgression is to kill probably tens of millions of non-white, non-Christian people. Mm -hmm. That's their goal. Now, so let me just think that they, they, they lead people to that goal from the great replacement theory, the theory of white genocide, the theory of feminist betrayal, the theory of cultural Marxism, and then the practice of metapolitics. So telling stories through symbolic violence. They rarely need to kill people. When they stand at the Greek border, rounding up migrants at gunpoint, as they did last year, the, the identitarians are only saying to the, each other, this is how it will be when the real thing happens. So that from that, we need to evolve our anti-fascism. We need to understand it is primarily a preparatory storytelling, symbolic violence movement, and that it, it pulls people in through the central logic of irrationality, which it borrows directly from... Uh, from the pre-1914 irrationalist philosophers. And here's another problem for the left. I bet you Houseman's physical bookshop, even now, is full of irrationalist philosophers of the left uh, books. And that's one of my problems. We are not going to be able to defeat it unless we have, um, unless we root ourselves in an epistemology, you talk about ontology, in an epistemology based in reality and the mm -hmm. possibility of truth statements and scientific method. Um, so, so that's my kind of general statement about who they are and who we need to be. Mm -hmm. Heterogeneity, I think, is also a um, aspect of the legal and procedural agency of the contemporary right wing, which I, uh, on, in my research, focus on because for me, all those this irrationalist, brutal, violent extravaganza is obviously a mythology which has always been with, with fascism, so I don't contradict that part. Yeah. But to me, what, what is important and what is happening right now, for example, in Poland, where the local governments are voting laws, um, sort of clearing the whole regions of LGBT people. Yeah. I'm not sure if you heard about that. Yeah, yeah. But, and this is done, so this laws which contradict every legal act uh, in Poland from constitution down to local, uh, you know, local small laws, and it contradicts the European law as well. Yet still, this kind of declarations against the LGBT uh, communities and individuals are being passed, and it goes slowly. So one community, another community, you know, this region, that region, and finally, you observe that one fourth of the map of Poland is covered with supposedly laws, although yeah. I would contest it, banning the LG, or, or, or protecting the traditional Polish family from some, um, uh, uh, you know, from what they call the LGBT uh, uh, ideology, for instance. And then, so when you discover that one fourth of an, a civilized country in the middle of Europe uh, is, is having this kind of laws, you understand that, and you know, in those laws, as well as in the sort of theory that comes behind those, there is nothing demonic. You know, there is no uh, raping or killing, nothing, no bad words, no uh, vi direct violence, nothing like this. It's protection. So it's like, you know, you have the model of pater familias, and now you have this kind of toxic matter. Like, we're, go we're gonna care for you, you and your traditional, beautiful, white Polish family. Yep. We're gonna protect you from those queers who are willing to destroy you and whatever else. But so it's nothing against the, the, the non-heteronormative people. It's always focusing on the family. And yet it can lead because it's also legally completely undefined. So it's unspecified who those people are, what like 
there is no direct, uh, you know, so basically there is a huge irrationalism on the level of constructing a supposedly legal uh, document. And right now there are different court battles in Poland happening about those yeah. rules. And there is also a big battle with the European Commission who is explicitly saying, we're gonna stop the money for those regions because we are not certain if this money is gonna be used according to the anti-discriminatory. So what do you think? Do you think that also in, you know, or in the US, all those, you know, slowly crawling um, reforms or deforms of, of women's rights, for instance, to me, they are also a work of, of today's uh, fascism in a sense yeah. that they jump into procedures, they produce greatly irrational, unjustified, uh, you know, uh, changes, transitions and proposals, and then they force uh, 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 those things to be passed. And I believe if we talk about that a little bit more than this extravaganza, um, perhaps it's easier to, to translate it to people who don't believe that fascism exists today, who unfortunately are many. Yeah, I mean, look, the, you know the Polish situation better than me. I mean, paradoxically, Rosa Luxemburg's own town, Zamosh, has been declared an LGBT free zone. Oh, yeah. And they took down her monument, of course, her plaque. Um, in the chat, there's, there's quite a bit of objection to the idea of, of a temporary alliance with liberalism to defeat fascism. Okay. And, but, I, but, but, but this is a good example, because what it means practically is that the feminist movement and the left uh, and the LGBT movement in Poland has to see the European Commission as an ally. It may not be, it, no, in the end, you know, the German bourgeoisie will use Poland as a cheap labor, uh, you know, offshore uh, economy, and they're quite happy to keep the, the Law and Justice Party in power. They will never pull the plug on it. And they will, you know, however, there are social movements in Germany, there are social movements throughout Europe, and it is a legitimate demand to put Poland and Hungary in the freezer, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, politically, until these laws are dropped. Same time, in right now, in America, the, the number one issue is the attack on Roe v. Wade. And, you know, it's now, I'm pretty certain 14 to 18 states will pass carbon copy laws to the Texan law, and, and within two years, by the time... Congress, of course, in 2022 becomes uh, zombified because the Rep Republicans fight, fight back and, and nullify Biden's majority. We, we face two, cha two, two, two choices. What was the Women's March? I mean, I know the people who organized the Women's March, Winnie Wong among them, and, and uh, uh, no, numerous other leftist activists. They had to go into rooms with Gloria Steinem and the <laughs> classic liberal uh, feminist and force them to say you're going to march, you're going to you're going to pay money, and you're going to put Palestinians on the platform. Uh, Linda Sarsour is on the platform. Women of color are on the platform. It's a struggle. They don't liberals don't like it. But what here's my here's what I hope comes out of it. If we, the left, as in the 30s, can show that we are consistent and reliable and selfless fighters against this new fascism, whether it's the attack on, on reproductive rights in America, whether it's the attack on LGBT in, in, in Poland, we can pull the mass base of liberalism towards us. That's what, in, in the end, that's what the Popular Front did for the Comintern. It created a, a, a mass ethos in which who prospered was communism. You know, I'm no fan of Comintern communism, but that's what, what worked. And I think that the, 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 the one other thing, other thing I would say is that the... It opened the door to a kind of politics where the grassroots are in control. The, the, um, in one of the textbooks about the Popular Front, I've, I've forgotten now who, it's an English academic who's written, it's a superb book, I'll look it up. Uh, he says, he points out that in one department of France, now there are, there are 70 odd departments of France, there was probably something like 100 grassroots committees so if you imagine, if you translate that, every town gets its, its, its committee for what? In America, it's got to be to defend Roe v. Wade and to stop Trump. In Poland, it's got to be, you know, it, what it was for, for a time was defending the, the Constitution and the, and the judges against the attacks by the law and justice. If we could have activated those into more serious grassroots 
uh, campaigns. I'm certain they would have involved people like, you know, the kind of Anne Applebaum, Radek Sikorsky, bourgeois liberals, because they realize that they are now in a game of mass politics and they can't play mass politics because they've been sitting there in the LSE and the IMF and the Brookings Institution for 20 years doing nothing apart from writing articles. So it, that's a concrete example I would, I would want to offer to people who are skeptical about the idea of Popular Front 2.0. To the, the Democrat Party in America is a popular front, and by engaging in it, Sanders and Ocasio-Cortez have actually achieved more than I think the left has done for 20 years by standing apart from it. Mm. I believe that the necessity of trying to of trying to apply various means of political action, meaning not only um, grassroots uh, press and uh, academic discussions, but also party politics, um, that it has a tradition on the left and there were leftist parties. I know that today it sounds like a big extravaganza, but believe it or not, there were huge socialist, labor, <laughs> communist parties in this continent, not, 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 not longer than 100 years ago or even 50 years ago in some yeah. countries. So basically we can do it, I think, and it's not impossible to, to be done. And also what is not impossible to be done, I think, is to try and perceive reform as something that, or perceive a revolutionary change as something that proceeds in many different social layers. So here, uh, another name of, of, of an academic and writer, but also an activist, Felix Guattari, um, who speaks of transversality. So we speak of social change that proceeds in all layers of society. And he speaks of ecology in this context, but also of feminist movements and anti-racist movements as those that require uh, various forms of pressure and various forms of uh, agency, not only in order to reach bigger masses of the society, but also to translate into transformations in different parts of, this, of, the, of the social. I believe that in this scale with milliards of, 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 of humans all over the globe, um, focusing on five persons, you know, little groups is not enough basically. And it's not enough, not because it's lazy, because it might take all your effort, but it's not enough because it's not gonna reach out to, to bigger parts of the, of the population. So to me, for instance, an activity in a political party does not necessarily mean that I want to take power, although I wouldn't mind, but it also means that I get to access via media, via presentations, via um, institutionalized politics, I get to access larger parts of the society and at least propose some alternative to the kind of politics they, they, they are daily experiencing. Yeah, I mean, and I think that, that obviously one of my frustrations with not just the far left, but the, the social democratic left is that they are they, they have not thought through the implications of, first of all, the rise of network society. So, you know, a lot of, even now, there, there's large parts of the left that don't really get the idea that the, the network's individual, you know, as, as uh, Manuel Castells calls the networked individual, is a different historical subject to the to the proletariat. It's just a different. It's it's a version of the proletariat, but it's as different from you know the workers who made the Paris Commune were involved in modernity. They were involved in in light shows, in you know in in a, a kind of sexual liberation, etc. The workers who made the French Revolution in 1789 were kind of almost like sort of a different different ethos. Today. We just have to live with the fact that, first of all, networks create a different so historical subject. Second, the multiple forms of exploitation. And this is where I ground my, my uh, understanding of who is the demos, who is the multitude, different from, from, from Negri. It's, I think there is an ec economic basis to what we call identity politics. That is, the we are... You, my father's generation could, a mother's generation could really only be exploited through their work. That was the number one form of exploitation. The idea that they were exploited through consumption, through finance, they didn't have finance. They, they barely consumed goods. They didn't, uh, they didn't prosume, they didn't co-create brands. Um, they, they didn't pay rent. Uh, they weren't rentiers. 
they were simply workers. Today, the, the ruling elite extracts capital, extracts value from us through finance, through consumption, through rents, through, uh, through data extraction, through, through our behavior online. And because of that, each of these sectors is a way in which we can confront capital. That's my ultimate, that's my maximum program. That's where I want society to go. And of course, over climate, the decarbonization story either ends with, with a, a massive attack on capital or it doesn't end at all. Um, but in the light of that, so people are worried about liberalism. Here's the problem. The old proletariat in Britain had a huge liberal wing, also in Germany. That's why the Christian trade unions existed. You know, they had millions, millions of liberal workers. Um, what is Blairism? What was Blairism? What is Starmerism other than working class liberalism? And so when people go, oh, I hate the liberals, you've also got to realize that liberalism has been a part of the labor movement, especially in places like, like, like the UK and America. So Luke, the modern liberalism takes the form of the networked identity struggle. And our job as leftists is to try and guide that towards a more strategic goal. But you can't do it by saying, and Trotsky used to say this, to the, in the classic Leninist formulation, you don't say to the working class, hey, as, assemble around my lectern while I give you a lecture. You plunge into what they are struggling around. And that's why it's so important for us, if we're going to build an anti-fascist movement, to build it around what pe people's positive struggles, whether it's around Black Lives Matter, Me Too, as you say, the Women's March, which was an ultra-liberal um, endeavor, the trans uh, rights movement, and the rest of it, and of course, workers struggling at the point of production, above all the new working class, you know, the, the international workers of the world and all of that. So I think that's the kind of, the modern equivalent of the communist movement, but it has to learn to reach out to somebody else. And that somebody else is the person sitting there terrified of the future, and, and somebody asked me in the, in the thing, you know, in the questions, what do I mean by a glimpse of freedom? The glimpse of freedom that has triggered this isn't a workers' revolution. It was in Italy in 1920, Russia in 1917, Germany in 1919. That's what the bourgeoisie was terrified of and why it ran towards fascism. Today, it's Black Lives Matter. It is... Fridays for the future, it's extinction it's rebellion. Belief, no, it's Podemos, it's those moments yeah. where within institutions, because I think what scared you know, the right wing to death was actually the creation of Syriza, and Syriza has tremendous success in Greece. Yeah. This was so scary. Incidentally, incidentally, was, go on. It was, it, it, was, it was terrifying because there were not only, I mean, for Greece, Syriza was progressive in all kinds of ways, but also by means of women who suddenly got into power. Yeah. This wasn't very often in, in Greek society. Until. They had never seen powerful feminist women in, in, and in then they power. Them. And not <laughs> just, not just the old, Reina Duru, who is a friend, who was the uh, prefect of Attica under Syria, Syriza, and Zoe Constantopoulou, who uh, is a dissident member of Syriza, quite ultra left, but the, the, the most famous lawyer in Greece, suddenly she's the speaker of parliament. Now, I want to say something about Syriza because Syriza has a huge bad press in the, in, in the British left. And yeah, they, they sold out at the crucial moment in the struggle against the IMF. But a lot of people don't realize that without Syriza, it, there was a real possibility the Golden Dawn would have, would have scooped up the working class and peasant radicalism that Syriza did. Okay, um, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna- I saw I'm gonna... it in reality in front of my eyes in villages in Greece, the, the election in 2015, in, in one village where I, where I was filming, was it was literally Syriza and Golden Dawn versus each other, and exactly. the main parties had evaporated. Exactly, but you know, in order to, because you say we, we this, we that, we anti-fascists, yeah. we, and honestly, for me, you know, my anti-fascism is to defend the, the right to be weak, the right to be irrational at times, and the right to be, you know, somebody who could possibly give birth. That's, that's my we. And it's not exactly your we, although, you know, you can try. Uh, I, I, I support that, but, <laughs> but you know. So basically, the, my last sort of interjection and my last sort of question would be, 
concerning the we, because I believe, I mean, your book and, and what you say here convinces me to a large extent. And I'm with you on a lot of, you know, a lot of points that you make. But then there are those moments when I feel, okay, the we that you are talking about is not exactly the one where I feel at home, basically. And I'm not saying it um, as accusation. I'm more <laughs> concerned with a certain history of building anti-fascist legacy and anti-fascist theorizing, which which we both come from. So I also can I also can do that. So it's not only. I'm, but how do we? So I don't want to put it on, so, solely on you. How do we build a we? The, so a community, a a, um, a plural um, subject, political subjectivity that makes sense to a lot of very different people. Yeah. Because, for instance, with this with the Syriza, they to me they have shown that dispersed social movements, minoritarian movements, anti-authoritarian movements can gain power. Yeah. This was a lesson that I will never forget. And a lot of people, although they repress it by saying, oh, these bad people sold us, whatever. But later, you know, from a more Hegelian kind of, you know, historical perspective, in 100 years, Syriza is going to be an entity that if the world survives, children are going to learn about as the perhaps only radical, you know, entity of, of political um, activists and groups that got so much power. In this I, would, I would I would add the mass the the, the movement for socialism in Bolivia. Uh, again, I, I've I've seen it in my with my own eyes, been there, interviewed Morales uh, when he just became president. So I would add them. So the answer to who is the we? So it, the book, the payload of the book. So for those who haven't read it, the book starts with analysis of modern fascism, its ideology, its thought architecture, and 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 how it acts. Then it replays. The, the rise to power of Mussolini and Hitler as if they could have been stopped in a way that historians don't like to do, as a, almost like a board game. How do you win against them? And the end point is the argument for popular front, for, for legal crackdowns, and that's another unpopular thing on the left, legal crackdowns on them, tech regulations. And then the final bit is the argument for an anti-fascist ethos. And it's something that, you know, I, I've... Um, it's... I've been building towards in, in my work because, uh, you know, the last chapter of the book, the jump off point is the movie Casablanca, which I think is the greatest, not only on film, the greatest anti-fascist movie, but in a way, it's the greatest movie made by anti-fascists. Because if you look at uh, I, the research I did was for, through weird Hollywood hagiogra hagiographies of the people who made Casablanca. But it is the fact that only about three of the 14 speaking characters was American. And that some of the key characters, like, like the croupier in the uh, casino, or the, the woman who's like, you know, to use 1940s language, the tramp, the woman at the bar who's kind of a sexually loose woman, she lived for real. Uh, they lived, they were a couple, the croupier and the woman at the bar. Uh, were, were a real couple who'd escaped Nazism. And in fact, many of the actors were anti-fascists and leftists. And we think, together with Howard Koch, who was a communist, who wrote the, the, the second draft, that they, the, on the set, they brought their experience of fleeing fascism into that movie. Now, what does that movie tell us? It tells us that if you fought fascism once and lost, you can al always still decide to fight it again. And what what the, the, the ensemble cast teaches in that movie is that all kinds of people can fight fascism. So if you think about who, you know, Rick Blaine, the Bogart character, he's a loser, he's a drunkard, he's a cynic, but he decides to do it. The cop, the policeman, the corrupt sexist predator decides to fight fascism. And the woman at the bar who's been uh, sleeping with the Germans, she decides to fight fascism. I think out of that, that and many other stories um, from f that were created by the Popular Front movement, both in France, in America, in the UK, that came by, by around the time the war started to be a Popular Frontist ethos that transcended leftism and liberalism. And that is, I, I think, we're only going to create we, the modern equivalents, the modern equivalents don't just include radicalized, 
activists around feminism, climate, transgender, it does include the cynical, you know, we don't often call them the centrist dads, the cynical, you know, Generation X people who've given up. That's the modern equivalent of Bogart in that movie. And that's what I think we need to, to, to learn from. So I believe that you're kind of reaching out to uh, to uh, a very different group of people that than, than me when I speak of weak resistance, for instance, and weakness as an element of political strategy that has to be sort of rehabilitated. So in my research, I'm going towards those groups that were muted and excluded, starting with women, but then we go through various groups that you enumerated, yeah. but also people who were racialized and, and uh, kept on the borders, like the refugees and like, you know, all those people who don't have papers and, and, and who do yeah. all the fundamental work for Western societies without gaining any citizenship, any rights, any respect and any good salary and any safety at work, for instance. So I believe that um, that in order, so you, you want to embrace a, 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 a cynical centrist, which is fine, I, 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 I don't mind. But then I'm thinking also of, you know, housekeepers, women locked in their homes, literally sometimes, who basically, um, might want to join some em emancipatory movement, but when they when they feel and when they hear this kind of you know um, uh, militantist um, agenda, yeah. they're kind of lost because this is not what they've been doing. They've been taking care of people, doing reproductive labor, all those things that need, I think, to be embraced by anti-fascism. So that's another last question. So <laughs> I, I, want to... I, I, you know, I, I think we're on the same page in elevating the question of women's oppression and women's liberation to, the, to, to a primary status in explaining what, what drives um, so many people. And we mustn't underestimate it. Tommy Robinson had a million followers on Facebook when Theresa May had 500,000. This is before Tommy Robinson was banned. I think there are about a million people already susceptible to fascism, to, there's, to the... The militarized anti-vaxxism, which is the latest iteration, to the QAnon, you know, which was crazed. There's about a million people. And if you look at who goes on those anti-vax, the, the violent anti-vax uh, demos, it is often, uh, really interestingly, the dislocated working class people. And I mean, by that, I mean people who don't vote, they don't wear really trendy brands, they are not very... Um, they're not part of anything else. They're not part of a kind of, you know, grime subculture. They're not part of a sort of football subculture. They're just almost like nobody. But they found, just as the Nazis did, they find in the movement suddenly an identity. Now, we, one part of anti-fascism is, for certain, stopping them radicalising and almost like talking them back through down to just being ordinary racists or ordinary anti-vaxxers. But the other part of it is fighting them. And I think this is what, may, what a, a lot of my work is aimed at mainstream politicians because I want mainstream politicians to realise what the danger is. The ma most mainstream politicians, Keir Starmer included, are not prepared to say some of my voters, some of the people in my constituency are fascists. Yeah, they're, they're, when they ring them up on the on the talk shows, they go, "Ah, you you may have a point. I, I'd like to sort of disagree with you." Some people are already gone, and we need to create a movement that can defeat them. It, it, we only de you'll only persuade them, but or talk them down from radicalism by actually defeating them by stopping them, and that remains the lesson of, of the old traditional anti-fascism. Mm -hmm. And I think the. The, the alliance that we need to create to you know, absolutely includes what you, you what you said the the weak the, the you know there are there are, but there are can I can I imagine well, you know, let's imagine that I'm a, a, a Polish cleaner back in the UK yeah. can I join a anti-fascist movement no my whole no, there isn't a, throughout yeah. my life has been to you know, to take care for, I don't know, children yeah. and to uh, do the reproductive labor. When I hear we need to fight them down, I'm kind of, even even on the level of, of, the, of the narrative, I'm yeah. pissed because as a, as a woman, I haven't been socialized to any fight whatsoever. I mean, I'm not talking about myself, well, right? This is really advocating, uh, we, you know. But we, are both, we are both fans of Wilhelm Reich. And here's the other thing. 
by by sidelining Reich in, in real time in 1932, the communists lost the entire tradition of the so-called sex poll movement, the sexual politics movement. Mm -hmm. People think this is weird. Think people think you know people don't want to talk about it even now. They think it's kind of a hippie weird shit, right? But what Reich did, he said, since what is driving people to Nazism is in part sexual repression, we need to do sex education. And the people we need to do it with are young people and women. And the Communist Party went, whoa, you know, what, young people and women? Okay, so Reich's group, there were 40,000 activists in sex poll. They went into factories where there were no communists, no socialists, no trade unions, where women were the main workforce, and they offered birth control and and sex advice. Okay, not, women, not just can, also, women yeah? can also do uh, other things than yes. reproductive uh, labor. Yeah. Women, women do a lot of other things. And so, but not necessarily, so beyond fighting and caring, there are there is a plethora of ways uh, that has have to, I think, be advocated for yep. as necessary as, imp and they are central, because without a good, well-organized, you know, yep. network, and network doesn't mean well working internet or computer network is a lot of people with communication skills that that that, that help all of us you know autists mm -hmm. scholars uh, fighters and and whoever to calm down and and talk with each other yeah. you know? I, I, let me say for example in salford in in near manchester in the city of salford there is a, a social center called partisan and for me this is the blueprint to the way the, this things could all, all be organized they 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 have got. They, it's been organised by autonomists, uh, you know, the, the soft autonomous movement, people who were in Plan C at one point, um, and some from the Labour left. And what they do is they, for example, they don't just run things like food banks. They have a gym. They have a gay gym, gay only gym. They have a uh, sober days. So even though the left loves drinking, they have got days when only people who are uh, in recovery from addiction can go. They have clothes banks. It's exactly like the average, you know, anarchist social centre, but its overt purpose is to create something bigger out of everything. And I think that, I think that's the model. It's, the, the model is pretty easy to do, but it just involves the left stopping the, its obsessions with ritualistic politics, whether it's ritualistic social democracy, ritualistic Leninism, or even Luxembourgism. To be honest, it's, it's about understanding that when we create these grassroots these rhizomic movements, they're not just there to defend our, us and to allow us to live within capitalism. Their new task is to mobilize against this threat. Mm -hmm. And so that might be a good way to... Very nice. I yeah. think that as we are... So thank you so much for this kind of summarizing uh, proposal on how to fight fascism and how to build lively embodied alternative. And then we have another question from the audience, which uh, from John Booth. Um, uniting with liberals is an understandable idea, but can we trust them to unite? Seems that they would rather destroy the left no matter what, and they have never been trustworthy throughout history. Are liberals and centrists interested in uniting? Well, look, what throughout history, let's take the example, you know, um, the, 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 French, the French radical party, which was a liberal party, uh, which had several offshoots, voluntarily decided to form a government with communists and socialists in 1936. Likewise, the, the Republican radicals of Spain, who were not socialists, voluntarily decided to form a, a popular front government with communists and socialists and indeed Catalan nationalists and Basque nationalists in Spain in 1936. Now, what persuaded them to do that was the existential realization that democracy was about to be uh, destroyed. Yes, liberal, so yes, we, me, a Marxist, I am not a liberal. I have a philosophical difference with liberalism about human freedom and progress in history. And the economists summed it up very well. For, for liberals, classical liberals, it says the economist last week, there is no goal of history there's, and there's no goal of progress. Well, for me, there is. But I want to try and argue with the left to stop using liberal as an insult and, and as the placeholder for the worst assholes we can think of. They are no longer the worst assholes we can think of. Um, you know, they they are they are 
they're untrustworthy allies in a fight against fight to defend democracy. And their theorists are some of the worst. Some of the worst are these kind of liberal lawyers like Zipblatt and Levitsky in, in America who say openly, no, don't change the Constitution. No, don't uh, fight, you know, don't pick battles over the Supreme Court. Whatever you do, don't politicize the democratic Constitution. It's politicized. And the argument we have to have with them is that is to is that if they want to defend this thing they love, which is you know the liberal democracy, they're going to have to, as in the 1930s, look to their allies on the left in the plebeian masses and among the people you describe ever, you know the 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 the, the migrant workers, the refugees, the the LGBTQ people. We're all going to have to defend this thing that that is a carapace of defence for us. And so yeah, I mean they they are. Right now, it's difficult. Um, yes, uh, let me let me say one thing that might persuade some of our um, uh, participants of tonight's uh, of tonight's discussion. Um, uh, in this um, government in Spain, one of the ministers for for social affairs and family was Federica Monsigny, one of the Mujeres Libres, the anarcho feminist, perhaps the first famous anarcho feminist collectives uh, or organizations in revolutionary Spain. And who criticized her explicitly? Emma Goldman, sitting safely in London, you know, very unhappy that this wonderful Federica Monsigny betrayed her anti-state uh, you know, um, ideas. So I want to emphasize that not only an anarchist criticized you know, this Republican uh, uh, hybridic uh, Spanish revolutionary government, but that an anarchist was sitting on uh, a ministerial, you know, a ministerial armchair in this government, because I think we tend to forget about it and we focus and fetishize uh, anti-state uh, rhetorics in situations when this criticism and this withdrawing from voting, from participating in political institutions will cost us all the founding going to radical left, the uh, right wing, and all the um, decision making being in the hands of the very liberals that some people hate so much, but also the ultra conservatives and fascists who might have, you know, dangerous, violent um, uh, ideas about our future. Okay, further question. Much of the Corbyn left spent its time in, in charge. Uh, Ah, much of the Corbyn left spent its time in, char uh, in charge... In charge of the Labour Party. Ah, sorry, there is a spelling mistake. De demigrating and insulting the Blairite uh, left as, a cent as centrist deaths and telling them to um, this and that, uh, to the Tories, and uh, that the left is not the place for them. Surely there is not building the coalition you're seeking. Well, surely... Okay. Well, so, okay, I, I think... That is that might be a caricature, but it certainly happened. And uh, I don't want to spend my time actually re-litigating re -lit what went wrong with Corbynism. I've written at length about it. The book doesn't deal with this. But since you asked that question, you know, I, I was someone who was very close at the, in the first phase of Corbynism, on the inside with, with Jeremy and John McDonnell. And I continually urged them to reach out both to the politicians they needed to have on the inside, who weren't on the inside, and to those voters. And I think they, they did. They, they genuinely wanted to do that. And what, what, what made it impossible was when Brexit exploded the British, um, the British left, to be honest, and liberalism. It, it, it just created a huge divide. People refer to it as a wedge issue. But it wasn't just that. It created a, a psychological enmity whereby people were starting to blame the very voters and the very influencers that we needed to convince in order to take power. They were blaming them for us not taking power. And so I, think I regret that. And in my practice, all that I could do was to try and do something different. And as you, everybody knows, you know, I joined the People's Vote movement in an attempt to stop it becoming a rival party. Uh, I think that was a success. Uh, I wanted to mobilise uh, for a second referendum because I thought that the Brexit was a, a right wing dead end by then. Parts of the left thought, rather like the Communist Party thought in Germany in the 20s, that by following the right's agenda, you might be able to win over some right-wing people to revolutionary socialism. Well, that didn't work out. Not you know, As far as I'm... I can't, I can't think of a single person I've ever met who came from the Brexit Party, UKIP world, into left politics because some leftists supported Brexit. Um, or indeed, you know, uh, any other good examples. Mm -hmm. So... 
The, the point is now, for me, to say to everybody who was involved in Corbynism, it was of its time produced by a mass movement against austerity. There's now going to be a mass movement against the attacks on women, on women's rights, on black rights, on refugees, on workers' rights. It'll be different, and we will have, and we should seek liberal allies and right-wing social democratic allies. It's a different game. Um, if you want an explanation of why I do what I do, that's because, because I realise that it's a different game and there's a different dynamic. I think to, what we could win in Britain over the next three to four years is quite substantial, actually. If we can, if, if, if the, if we can form some kind of electoral coalition that keeps the Tories out of power and dumps them out of power for decades by changing the constitution of the country, uh, if we can avoid outright Scottish independence, but go to some form of much more negotiated federation, uh, if, if, if the Scots will accept that, maybe not, they'll just want independence, so good luck to them. So that's the end of the British Empire, it's the end of British imperialism, if that's what you want to call it. You could achieve that, you could achieve a non-fascist, non-racist, non-xenophobic, non, you know, aping the, the language of, of, of the far right, a government that doesn't boo its own black players when they play football, that's a big thing. And just like in France, if we build the bottom of it, the, the grassroots of it, independently of the Labour Party, independently of uh, the Lib Dems and the SNP, if we create cross-party committees and centres like this partisan one I'm talking about, then, just as in France, that if we get a, a progressive government in Britain, which will include the SNP, the Greens, Plaid Cymru, and, and maybe the Lib Dems, maybe, I don't know, the whole of the Labour Party, the, the SDLP, and maybe even Sinn Féin, who knows? Maybe we could, could persuade them once to do something at Westminster for the prize of this. We get a progressive government, you then get, you get, then get constitutional change, you get the rule of law, you get PR, and you get the space for an upsurge. That's my project. Um, mm -hmm right now in Britain. We, we got another question, a very different question from Sam. Uh, Eric Hobsbawm wrote about the striking participation of scientists in interwar communism and anti-fascism. How might that speak to the context of climate breakdown in the early 21st century? Really interesting that, yeah. Of course, we tend to think of artists and it was the artists, Picasso, Jean Renoir, you know, the filmmaker, you know, even Edith Piaf and, and, and you know, Django Reinhardt was creating the ethos of the Popular Front, and of course, uh, you know, filmmakers like Michael Curtis, uh, you know, and, and who made those left-wing films in, in Hollywood. But yes, scientists, and in the original Popular Front, scientists were you know, the, the three people in charge of it were an art, were a philosopher, a scientist, and a, and a, and a writer. So scientists know that they realise that. To a far greater extent than in the 1930s, fascism has to promote pseudoscience because its two big pseudoscientific claims are that black people are genetically inferior to whites, so that's race science, and that women are genetically programmed to be the, the so-called feminine, feminine gender roles. You know, and, and I read a lot of this stuff for writing this book. It is laughable. The 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 sad thing is the race science has been more or less effectively policed to the margins of official academia. So Noah Carl, who's, you know, who's this uh, academic at, at Cambridge, was sacked for taking part in a non-peer-reviewed journal that promotes um, black people are stupid as the theory. Yeah? But evolutionary psychology, which is the basis for all the anti-feminist stuff, has a far greater reputation. It's worked its way in to so-called behavioral science. And Right, so now real mainstream scientists who want to defend the scientific method, want to defend peer-reviewed journals, want to defend the, the role of the university as a truth keeper and truth giver, the, the, they're, they're being doxxed by fascists. Look at what's happened to, to Primavera Gopal, you know, uh, for, 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 defending, for defending herself. They're being doxxed, they're being hounded. Uh, and so the scientists are on the front line. And I, I take hope from this because scientists have a huge uh, social status and political status, and partly because of 
climate change, partly because of COVID-19. We're seeing two real-time examples of how brilliant science can be as, as a form of social technology for the human species. And so uh, Hobsbawm is absolutely right uh, to, to, to point that out. Um, mm. And I think that I can, again, all we need to do, what we need to do is overtly reach out. We need to ask them, look, to defend science, you're going to have to defend democracy. You're going to have to defend channels for truth. You're going to have to disparage, you know, conspiracy theory and the, the junk that's out there in, in those conspiracy theory worlds. Mm -hmm. So I, I think they're our natural allies and we need to overtly reach out to them. I Absolutely. think we're being asked to shut up, aren't we, Ava? Yes, exactly. So this is why <laughs> this is what I wanted to say that this question was the last question that we uh, we discussed. And I would like to thank you uh, to thank you, um, uh, Alice, for uh, for having us, and thank you, Paul, for the book, for the lively spirit of anti-fascism. This is exactly what I needed these days, uh, living in Poland. So it was it was a great adventure to read your book, to discuss uh, tonight, and and also thank you to everybody who um, listened to us. Thank you to everybody who asked the uh, amazingly interesting questions, and thank you, Paul. And can I just say for, to people who buy the book if you like it talk about it um it would be really great to get a conversation going about it i'm particularly proud of the audio book because i did the voices myself so i added to goebbels and uh and hitler uh but you know if you like audio books you'll like my one but anyway thanks for coming Thank you so very much. And also, if you want to buy my book, it's there. Yeah. Discuss it. Discuss both books. Agree and disagree. And, uh, you know, keep the spirit of anti-fascism alive, please. Thank you so very much. And <laughs> have a good night. Bye. Thank, Thank you, Eva. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye, bye.